it's the next level. I was born for battle. Built for it. Sometimes in battle, a perfectly crafted plan gets compromised. A true general comes up with a better one right there on the spot. Working without a net. Hey, panelers, welcome to the show. I'm Steve. And I'm Daphne. And this is going to be a spoilerful podcast about the third episode of Snowpiercer Season 3. And uh, Daphne, we have a, a synopsis here and a title. Uh, why don't you read that for us? Okay, so the title for this episode is The First Blow. And the synopsis goes like this. It's a game of cat and mouse as both Leighton and Wilford vie for the upper hand. Very good. Very good. So what was your initial reaction? Okay, so I have multiple feelings. One, I love a satisfying conclusion. And I feel like this episode gave us some satisfaction. I love to see people get a comeuppance when they deserve it. And I feel like we definitely got to see that in this episode. I've realized over the last couple of years that the show has been on that they definitely don't hold back when it comes to violence and using the cold to torture and punish people. As we saw in this episode, oh my gosh, Ooh. strong boy. Oh, uh, that one hurts. Yes. He's been with us since the beginning. Yes. Wilford and his narcissistic tendencies, that's the thing that bit him in the butt because Javi tried to. Javi tried to get him to understand that he needed to slow down. And he disregarded him multiple times. So he really has no one to fault for himself. I guess the only thing that I kind of had an issue with is I felt like the last 10 minutes, maybe, a lot happened. And I think I would have rather them spread some of it into, the, into next week's episode because... I wanted to savor it just a little bit more because we got some reunions and situations were revealed. And now I guess next week's going to be all about how they deal with it. But I, I guess I would have liked to have had just a little extra time to savor some of this stuff because there yeah. were some touching things that happened. Yeah, they seemed to jump. They kind of jumped over a couple of things there at the end. I think I've got some of it in my, in my notes as well, uh, that they, that they could have, like, I, I like that saver. We, we wanted to savor the victory a little bit more, but they move, you know, they move right into that vote. And then we get, but we get to see a little bit of, of life coming back to Snowpiercer and, and people becoming, you know, happy again and smiling, but we get that. It's very, very brief. So yeah, I, I wish I'm with you there. I wish we could have got a little bit more of, of that, but. Uh... Yeah. So that, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great episode. I still stand by Ruth being my favorite character right now, but there are things that I'll bring up in my points that are kind of interesting between her and Pike that I just kind of want to talk about. But yeah, overall, I thought it was a great episode and I'm really looking forward to next week's because I did watch the previews, but none of that's going to influence anything that I say today. Yeah, I uh, I caught the preview the second time and there was something in there that I want to talk about, but at the same time, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. So maybe at the very, very end, we might uh, say something when we talk about the title and stuff of the next episode, because I did finally get a title. There was a synopsis in IMDb for a long time, but no title. And then this morning there was a title in there. So. Yeah. They're not putting the titles and any other information in there until very late, because I looked, because we were talking about, well, when does the season end? Because both of us are doing additional podcasts and we're kind of just planning things out. So I was looking at it and 
I don't think there's anything after next week's episode. There are dates and then episode like 3.6 or whatever, but there's no title or synopsis in there for any of the yeah. additional episodes. Yeah, so I don't know if that's going to if that's if they're going to fill that in later or what's going to happen there. It's going to be interesting to to talk yeah. about that. So Well, with that, let's uh, let's get into our top 5s. You ready for this? Ben takes us close, I jump over, breach the big Anderson engine, and you reconnect. We only get one shot at it. Well then, better not miss it. And as always, Daphne, I let the lady start. All right. Well, I'm going to start off with, I guess, Leighton as a leader, because sometimes I'm not sold on him being a leader. I've questioned it a few times, I know, over the course of the last two seasons. But I one thing I wanted to point out is his ability to learn from others and use it for, like, switching it around or modifying it to, to fit what he needs. One big thing, um, of course, is he's been a student of watching Wilford and trying to figure out how to get one up on him. And he used some of Wilford's own tactics against him by distraction. And he not only utilized Josie as the distraction, but Audrey as well, because the, all of that time that Wilford was looking through the screen and seeing Audrey on the other train, um, Leighton was on his way to Snowpiercer, to uh, Big Alice, to attack. Yeah. I've got this later in my notes, so we'll, we'll talk some more about it when we get there. I don't want to, I don't want to jump too far ahead of what, with what I've got in my notes, but, uh, but yeah, I, I liked Leighton in this, in this episode. I thought he did a, a really good job and there, again, there's more stuff in my notes that, that we'll talk about with, with Leighton. Um, and it's just that big, I've got a big section about the lie. So we'll, when we get there. Yeah, because uh, that's another thing. If you think about it, and I won't go into detail because since you have it as one of your points, we can talk about it more there. He had mentioned that he was doing the referendum, the referendum because that's what Melanie would do. However, Melanie also constructed a rather big lie. And Leighton has now constructed a big lie. Mm -hmm. which and we'll we talk saw, about a little bit more later <laughs> yes yes because we saw what happened when melanie's lie got found out so what's going to happen when leighton's uh lie gets gets found out so yeah um yeah i'm not sure <laughs> my first point really is is kind of a quick one but it, it's it's uh, that opening monologue by wilford was so good like it, it's just their opening these opening monologues by everybody are really really good and the voiceover as we're seeing the action happen and him talking about how he was built for war and he was made for this and like you said those narcissistic kind of tendencies but he said 1023 cars and I thought, didn't Ruth say 1,034 cars? Remember when they split off? Mm -hmm. I think they're now 1,023, as near as I can count, because... And now there may be even less, because remember, Snowpiercer had to cut off four cars. Mm -hmm. So they're, near as I can tell, they're at about like 1,019. Yeah, so we'll see next week what we what we hear as the car count, but I want to kind of take that, um, take that, move that, you know, I want to start talking more about that at, at the, at the jump, you know, cause that's, that's right at the beginning of every episode. They say how many cars we're talking about. And that again, I just go back to that. He wants to get his engine back. He wants to get Snowpiercer back and he resorts to these, drastic measures where he tells Kevin to take the gloves off and Kevin just with glee goes after that. And we see that sadistic side, not only of Wilford, but the even more sadistic side of, of Kevin. And, Oh, just, that was that you talked a little bit about strong boy. And that was so tough to watch the second time when he's just breaking his fingers off, freezing them, breaking them off. And then talking about his, his tongue 
And it just, oh, it was just, it was horrifying. And we got a, a few deaths in this episode. We did. That, that we see that the stakes are real. And I, I think, I, I kind of like that to, that we never know from one week to the next. I mean, obviously we, we can always be pretty sure that Leighton, Wilford, Al, these, these main characters are probably going to survive. Uh, yeah. Although I did have a note that even Leighton has started talking about Melanie in the past tense. Yes. And I didn't like that. I know. So, I know. We're all still holding out hope that maybe, maybe she could be alive. I don't know. Yeah, I'm maybe, starting to lose hope myself. I, I am too. I'm starting to, to, to think that maybe we'll get her in visions or something. But we'll talk about that uh, later. Later, I think. Yeah, definitely. So my next point is reunited because we saw some of our favorite characters get to be reacquainted with each other, or at least the drawers were opened. And I have to admit that at the beginning of the episode, I saw Michael Malley's name in the cast list. Oh, is and that I was so excited because all I could think is, oh my gosh, Roche, finally. <laughs> I know it's only been a couple of episodes, but oh, it's just been forever. And I think he's such a great voice of reason, and I'm glad that he's getting out of the drawers. However, um, however happy that we saw Till, we also are going to have to mourn the loss of his wife because she passed away, which is always a gamble that you take with those drawers. And some people just don't survive. And... I mean, they opened the drawer for Roche. They opened the drawer for his daughter, Carly, and she was okay. But when they opened the door for his wife, I believe her name was Anne, she had died. Yeah. And that just, that was heartbreaking. And it's right after we have this, this conversation between Till and Audrey kind of about Roche and, and this was in, this was in my notes. So I'm glad you, you brought it up because that conversation is, is really good where she, she starts out by telling Audrey, you know, when you sing, I sometimes think you're actually a decent person. And then she gets her jab in though, that I realize, Oh, all you sing is covers. So it's not your own words. It's not yes. your own ideas. Yes. Um, and yeah. then, and then Audrey tries to kind of jab back at her about, well, you and Roach didn't, Roach didn't have a good relationship, but we saw towards the end of that, of last season, that they started to grow a, a respect for each other and they were partners. Well, and Audrey says at the end of the day, there's only one person, there's only the person you sing for. And she's trying to draw out of Till who, you know, mm -hmm. who do you sing who she for? she sings for, yeah. And she just talks about the important people in her life, like Leighton and everyone and she mentions Roche because she did remember yes she did start growing closer to Roche especially last season so I think that this situation is very difficult for her because Roche made the decision for them to go in the drawers I believe I think it was his decision because yeah, he I couldn't be loyal he couldn't be loyal to to Wilford yeah, I'd have to go back and, and rewatch that last episode again because I did watch those last two episodes and I'm trying to remember if it was if it if it was kind of a choice kind of thing of well if you can't be loyal then you're gonna go I'm either gonna kill you or you're gonna go into the drawers. I don't remember yeah. exactly how it was, but I think you're right. It was kind of his choice, but at the, at the same time it was definitely Wilford saying, Well, this is this is you know, Yeah. Basically your only choice. Yeah. It's death or the drawers. Right. And he chose the drawers. And by doing that, his wife now is is no longer. So that's going to be something that I think is going to have huge ramifications. I mean, I think Roche is going to be angry with himself, but I think he's also going to be incredibly angry with Wilfred, who is still with us. Yeah, his daughter might be mad. Who, mm -hmm. who knows? It's it's gonna be it's gonna be good to see that reaction next week and see how it how it go, all goes about. Yeah, I have one more reunion though that I definitely want to talk about, and it's not Leighton and Zara, even though that was lovely. It's Ben and Javi. Yes, 
Because oh, I didn't have any of this in my notes, so I'm glad you go ahead. No one's been able to get through to Javi this whole time. None of them have been able to really get through to him. However, at one point, Ben says to Javi, Ubre una cerveza amigo, which means open a beer, my friend. I went and looked it up because I wanted to know exactly what he was saying. I'm glad you did because I didn't. So. And that's when he opens the door that Leighton is able to get into. And he doesn't really hesitate with that when Ben says that. And then later we get Ben on the train on Big Alice coming up to see Javi or what remains of Javi because Javi is so traumatized. And he hugs him and Javi is still very traumatized. I'm not sure if he realizes that it's real even because he's been six months in this continued tortured existence. And now it's going to take some time for him to let his guard down. And he, I don't know that he will ever be normal, but I think with a lot of effort on behalf of his friends, he might get back to somewhat of what we used to see. I just remember the the Javi we used to know and the Javi we have now is they're just two different people. Very different. Two different yeah, people. Very yeah. Broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um, my next one is uh, more crazy from LJ. Oh. <laughs> you know, we started to be sympathetic towards her and then we saw more crazy, but then, you know, I loved she has this great reaction when Kevin breaks into their bedroom and she's like, Kevin, you know, she just keeps <laughs> saying his name in this like petulant kind of way. Yeah. Uh, but there was I liked a, you know, that. It was funny. There was a, a kind of a strange look on her face when she told Oz to go put on some coffee. And I didn't know if maybe she was already planning to do something to Kevin. And she was watching way too close when he was torturing. Oh, of course. I feel like she would be, that would be her role in any post-apocalypse. She would be the one that would be, you know, cutting fingers off, ripping tongues out, doing all of these things. Uh, honestly, I wrote one note about LJ. I, I have a few others, but my main note about LJ was thank you. Because she took out Kevin and this season, the first couple of episodes, I realized that he didn't have any redeeming qualities left. He needed to go. And so she took care of that. Yeah. And I'm grateful. I had this, this was one other thing I wanted to say though about this is, is when she, when she tells Oz, we're just providing a, them a venue, there was a, a glee yes. in her, in her voice. So I, I, I'm torn. I, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm glad she killed Kevin, but at the same time, she's a murderer. She is like, very A multiple creepy. murderer. <laughs> and she flip flops to, to whichever side is going to keep her alive. Or I think the side that's going to provide her the most entertainment. And that cover of Eve of Destruction, I don't know. I didn't recognize the, the name of who yeah. was singing it. But uh, that was a really good cover of Eve of Destruction. So, yeah, Barry Maguire sings that cover of Eve of Destruction. I think it's perfect for that. Most of the songs that they have been picking have just been fantastic. The music... Like in so many movies that I really enjoy, the music is its own character. So that, yeah, that's all I really had about LJ. Just she's still crazy. Yes. Yes, she is. I, I don't know. Sometimes I like her and sometimes I don't. Maybe I think the actress is just playing her. I mean, she's a very complicated character at times because she's able to shift the way that she appears to people I may mean, remember back during her trial she was coming across as this meek little girl mm -hmm. and the now kid. yeah and now she's maniacal and vengeful and crazy at times you just really don't know what you're going to get with her and i think if leighton keeps her around he's just really going to have to i mean you'd have to walk on eggshells with her because you just don't know All right, well, my next one, I alluded to this a little bit ago, 
Pike's transformation because I feel like the Pike that we got early on in the series, the Pike we have now, Ruth has pretty much, I think, she's pushed him to be a leader, but she's also kind of facilitated and encouraged this change in him to be a bit more, like, constructively assertive. Not that he wasn't assertive before, but she's helping him channel his energy into something for the greater good for everyone. Yeah, and, I had this as my yeah. next one as well. So I'll have something to speak when you're when you're done. I've got some more to add to it. Well, at one point before he goes to see Ruth, he's wanting to go ahead and you know ambush the folks with the tanks, and Strong Boy and the other Taylor are just having to say to him, "Hey, you're the leader now. You can't be doing this. You need to." to go. So he decides to go see Ruth. That's hard for him because he wants to be, he's a very much someone who wants to be in the middle of everything that's going on. He doesn't want to be put on the sidelines. He doesn't want to be protected. He, he will risk it for the greater good, um, mostly for himself, but now for others too. And well, what I loved, yeah. what I loved about that scene was it's not it's not just Ruth seeing the leadership in him. It's not just him taking the leadership role, but it's other people mm -hmm. seeing him as the leader because that's what the guy says. You're in charge now. You can't be the one who does the yes. distraction. Uh, exactly. I, I think was just just outstanding. <laughs> and then the only, this is another I will say criticism of the episode that I had. I wish they had showed us how he organized that fireworks display. Yeah. Because we see him get the fireworks. Yes. And then he looks it around. And then the next thing we know, all these fireworks are going off at the same time all over the train. Yeah. I wish they'd and taken a little more time with things like that. I know that we're very much a society of want to know it now, want to get to the end point now. But I think in storytelling sometimes slowing down is the right idea. Now, I don't mean you have to go so slow that you're creeping, but part of me wishes this episode had been spread out over two episodes and that maybe this one ended with the two trains face to face and then next episode we'd get the whole of everything else because I feel like there's there are more things they could have showed us and then we could have, like I said, savored the comeuppance of Kevin, Wilford getting the shit kicked out of him, which was amazing. Oh, Wil Wilford, Wilford, you will be your own demise. Um, that was wonderful. You know, just, yeah, I wish that we'd had more time. Yeah, and I love that that Till was the one who saw the fireworks, and she's like, guys, look to the south, you know, and that whole, that scene, that image of the train going and all those fireworks going up and then Wilford just being deflated because he realized that they're, they're going to find us now. Yeah. So I thought it was just, just great. He relied on, yeah, he did not anticipate Leighton. He anticipated Leighton doing what he would do and not what Leighton would do. Like, he was thinking of Leighton as another hit version of him, and that's not what he should have done. He should have thought about, okay, Leighton knows that I'll probably do this, so what would he do instead? But he didn't look at it that way. He was too busy looking at it because he thinks so much of himself. He was too busy looking at it from his point of view. And that, yeah, it's it caused his downfall, and I'm not disappointed. Nope. And we'll, we'll see though. We'll see what happens going forward. It's, it's going to be exciting. So, uh, so that, yeah. that was mine, mine as well. So what's, uh, what's your next one? So my next one is those we lost. The ones that are both satisfying and the ones that are sad. As I said already, I'm super excited that LJ took out Kevin. I'm so glad to see him go. He's one of those characters that you just... I mean, we saw his transition from being meek and mild to being tortured to then coming into play and now becoming, I mean, basically another Wilford, just sadistic. 
and watching him torture strong boy it was just like okay there's nothing left in you you need to go and i love that lj just so nonchalantly is just talking to oz so carefully and then goes ahead and stabs him in the neck it was great loved it um but at I the think time I gasped. yeah I, think I gasped the first time because I, I, I was just so shocked and surprised the first yeah. time when i saw it and at the time, we didn't know that Strong Boy had died. Because at the time, I had just assumed that he had ripped his tongue out or cut his tongue out because that's what he was doing. And I don't know that Kevin necessarily meant to kill him or if that was just further torture and he just, you know, takes yeah, him out. I'm kind of glad we didn't see that. Yeah. His death, we saw the aftermath of it. But there definitely was something with his tongue. So maybe the freezing of his face to get at the tongue, I don't know. Yeah, it was very sad. I mean, we get to see it at the end. And first, you, you see Pike standing and just looking down, and I'm thinking, oh, no. Well, and Winnie was there as well. And Winnie was there as well. And so you knew that something bad had happened. And then they showed us his, like, his face frozen. So you knew he was gone. So that was just upsetting. Of course, we get Roche and his family back and find out that his wife Anna has died. So we lost a few in this episode. We lost some that we cared about and one that I don't let the door hit you on the way out. Kevin, enough of your foolishness. Yeah, I, I, I mean, let's talk a minute about Strong Boy and what he's meant to the series. I mean, we meet him in the first episode. We... He goes to the drawers with Pike. We've seen him throughout this be such a, a strength and a force of to be reckoned with when it comes to our Snowpiercer Tailies and then even Snowpiercer itself. We've lost others along the way, and he's been that force yeah, the entire he was that time. Rock. He was, he, you know, he took out, how many jackboots did he take out before in, in the revolution, you know, in the, in the revolt? And it's just, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, it's also one of those things just remind us that some of these shows like The Walking Dead, like this one, where stakes are high, where yeah. people aren't, are the characters we love might not last. Yeah. And any time somebody can be taken from us. Yeah. And they do. They'll take them. They'll take them very quickly. You just never know. I mean, we don't, like we talked about earlier, we don't know Melanie's fate right now. And thinking about it, it's like, oh man, you know, it's only a matter of time though, before they take someone really big. And I feel like by taking Strong Boy, they're getting close to the heart of the show because he was one of the characters that was part of Layton's core heart. And I feel like this is a huge loss. I... We'll be interested to see how, you know, now that he died, what impact that will have on the Taley group. Oh, well, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> my <laughs> next one is uh, Asha and the Lie. And we get to see more or we get to at least, I, I think I talked about this last week, that, that she's got to have some PTSD from that four years being alone. And we see that in this episode where when she goes into that one room, she tells Leighton to turn the lights out. And then she's got her helmet on and she's hyperventilating. And we, she says something to Leighton that tells me that there's more to her story. Because yeah. she she says to him, he says something about, I have a, a child on Snowpiercer and that's why I'm doing this. And she says, if you're doing this for a child, you're going to do things that you're going to regret. Yes. And I, I want... I want to know that story. And then at the end, when he convinces her, you know, she still thinks Wilford is the great engineer and he's mm -hmm. got to convince her and tell her, no, he's not. He's a narcissist who built this train so that he could be king. And mm -hmm. he wasn't, and we've, we've taken our, we've saved ourselves, you know? And so that convinces her to tell this lie that she was found by them in new Eden. Yes. And, and brought back as a way to, when they actually haven't even been there yet. 
So no. that's why, like we talked about the, the lie that Melanie told when her lie got told out. And I, I love that scene right at the very end where they're talking about all, where he says, you know, we don't have to tell any more lies. And Ruth is like, no, this train is built on lies. Yeah. Like there's, there was the lie of Wilford, the great engineer. There was the, the lie of, of the, the godlike engineer in, in the car. There was Melanie's lie. There was all these, everybody's had something that they've lied about. And when it comes out, it's devastating. Now yes. they're able to get past it. So this one, I just, I kind of hope, I, I, I don't know. I'm torn. Like I, 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 I keep saying I'm torn in this episode because there's things that they've alluded to that when we get to the end of the season, we're going to see how it, how it comes up. Because like, if they get to new Eden and it's frozen, yes. that's going to be trouble. Yeah. So I, I, I'm kind of part of me says, let's, let's find out the lie. But part of me is like, I really want New Eden to exist and be a place where they can get off the train. I, I don't know if they they have a plan for a finale season. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have not read anything or researched anything about if they have a, like if they had a five season or a four season or whatever, however many seasons they kind of had an idea. I hope they do because I would love for that for them to have a satisfying ending. Yeah, to me it. too. I don't want it to, I don't want it to go on so long that it just becomes regurgitating of the same things over and over again. Leighton's in trouble. Leighton's the leader. Leighton's in trouble. Leighton's the leader. Wilford comes back. Leighton's. Yeah. I don't, I really don't want that to be the situation. One thing about Asha though, I started to wonder where she's talking about children. I'm wondering if one of two things happened. Were there, did something happen with the children at the place that she was at? And, or two, is someone that she's, is her nephew really her son? Like she talked about that and that just makes me wonder, was that your nephew or was it your son? And I still think that the blood splattering that we saw there was way too fresh to have been like even four years ago. So I'm really not sure. I don't know how much we can trust her. Like Leighton's putting a lot of trust in someone that he really doesn't, hasn't been around. But again, he likes to see the best in people, which is why sometimes I think he's not really cut out to be the leader on the train because he he can't differentiate. He's not as perceptive as, say, Ruth or some of the others in determining who could be a threat and who isn't. So I'm just not sure. I think sometimes he should let day-to-day -day operations be handled by some other folks. I mean, look, Ruth and Pike did a really good job managing everything. So, yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm with you on that because I we don't know. And I, I went to the same place was that maybe the nephew wasn't was actually she talking about her son, not her nephew. And I didn't think about the blood splatter being more recent than yeah than four years because that would. But also, she's latched on to Layton. He saved her. And remember in the last episode, we talked about the fact that, that she said, you did something insane to save me. And he, he said, I'm glad I did. And so she, she has latched on to him as her salvation. Yeah. And so she's willing to tell this lie and she's probably going to be willing to maintain it. But I, I really, there's, there's something more I'm with you. There's something there's more something going more on. with her. I think too, she's not the type. I don't think she's going to be the type to run down the train singing, you are my sunshine. Like, I feel like she's more of a loner and that might help keep the lie going because otherwise there might be questions. And if someone sees her and she has to start answering questions, that's where things could get just a bit sticky. So I'm not sure what could happen there, but I guess we'll see soon enough. Yep, it's coming up. So I think we're to your number one. All right, so my last point is one big train again. And yes. part of that ties into the lie and how they're going to go forward with it. Um, another part is they've left Wilford alive. Leighton has left him alive. I don't know 
why other than I know he is a good person and wants to do the right thing and killing Wilford would just make him a martyr and his people would just rise up and there's no sense in that. But he's got to be very careful because as we saw Wilford talking to Josie, he's incredibly charming. And he knows how to get what he wants. And I just feel like if the wrong person is guarding him, there's going to be a problem. Yeah. And this was interesting to me. We see um, Till take Audrey back and she says, you're confined to third class and you can't, and you're banned from the night car. And, and then Wilford is in the cell, one of the cells somewhere. I didn't, I don't think he's in the library cell because no. Asha was in the library. It seemed. Yeah. So he's um, in the cell that I think he was holding Ruth in. That that's, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, but so they, they didn't get their first class cabin that they were no. that, that well, because, promised. Because he didn't accept the deal. You're Layton right. He had, he, Layton had to take the train by force. So yeah. Leighton did okay. He because that's what I did. I, now, now, I, now I understand. Leighton did say, "I don't want to have to be violent. I don't want there right. to be any violence." And he ended up having to be violent with right with Wilford. So okay, he did. That, uh, he forced that, Wilford to to give an address to stand down the troops so that there could be a peaceful transfer of power. But it's not because Wilford accepted what Leighton had offered. Because if he had then they might have given him the first class lodging. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but, you know, you've, you've talked about Wilford's narcissism. He just, he never would have taken that deal. He, he was going to have to be by force. Yeah. So that's, and it was basically Leighton making him say uncle. You know, yes. The, the kid, you know, uh, from well, Salem's Lot. Well, and he Lot, said, <laughs> yeah, he, he said, um, I am the train. So he sees himself as something so much bigger than the conductor or the engineer, like he sees himself as the king, as Leighton said, you know, earlier in the episode, you know, he wanted a place to rule. He wanted a place to be in charge and create this world. And he did that. But along the way, he hurt a lot of people and he continued to hurt people when he was in charge. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That makes that makes more sense. Now, and and it, what it looked like to me before I get to my last one, it looks like now Big Alice, the Big Alice engine is at the front and the Snowpiercer engine is in the middle? No. Or did they back did they back into the train? I think Snowpiercer is in front of Big Alice. I think they got turned around. So they could back into Big Alice. Okay, and so so Snowpiercer's back to being the front of I, the train. Um, I don't. We're gonna have to see it traveling. We're gonna yeah. have to see when they get it traveling because that, that's another thing that was a little bit. Uh, it's <laughs> hard know, to see in the a... dark. It's hard to see yeah. in the dark, and that's kind of what it was like. Is you you really couldn't see how it was put together, and I know that Ben was working with Alex to get it what looked like turned around. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have to see next week if we, if we get a direction or, or something of where they're, which way they're going. But I did love all the, the track switching and stuff. The only thing that kind of for a second in the second viewing, I was like, they're not, these trains are not supposed to stop. Like we, they made a big deal in the first episode about stopping the Snowpiercer train because it was going to burn out. It was going to burn up. You know, and Big Alice, if you stop Big Alice, they're going to freeze. Yeah. So it just, it, it, it'll it be interesting to see what next week, what, to, how they're going to handle the train and, and what's going on with it. Um, So my last one is a little bit about what you're just talking about, the, the being one train again. But the thing that got me there at the end when is Wilford, he convinces Ben to reconnect the trains because he stopped Big Alice and everybody's going to freeze to death. Mm -hmm. And this is where, this is where Wilford was so distracted by Miss Audrey. He didn't realize that Leighton wasn't there anymore. Yeah, no. Because he's, remember. Yeah, he's totally entranced by Audrey. Mm -hmm. Totally I, it entranced. Me, it kind of surprised me that he didn't figure it out that Leighton was doing something different, you know, 
But the key to the whole plan, and we talked a little bit about it, I think Javi is broken. Definitely. He's traumatized and he's broken. But yes. I think he's coming back because like you said, when when uh, Ben told him that phrase, he did not hesitate to open that. He just kind of slipped his hand over and opened that door and Leighton got in. And I just love that Javi was the key because if he hadn't done that, the whole plan goes out the window. Exactly. Josie's, Josie's not, you know, Josie starts to break the glass at the front. And so Wilford's got to, got to slam the, the door, uh, to, to make to save that. And that's where he backs right up into Layton and he realizes what happened. And he goes, Oh, I think he says something like clever or something, something like that, because he realizes that Layton is behind him and that he's just, he's just been beaten or that he's about to be beaten to a pulp and get his hand <laughs> crucified. And, that was so <laughs> good. So satisfying. I cheered when I saw that. Yeah, I I just it was it it, it made me grimace, but I I was I'm right there with you. It was it was such a it was such a satisfying fight that even though I mean it's Wilford's a big guy, so Sean Bean is is kind of a big guy, so it it should have been maybe a more it may have could have lasted a little bit longer, but I guess when you get a spike through your hand, that's pretty. That does take a little bit of the wind out of your sails, I think, when you're dealing with something for like that for an injury. Yeah. Like I said, I think there were things that could have gone on just a little bit longer. But I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I guess we'll see in the remaining seven episodes exactly the story that they're going to tell. Yeah. I mean, the cinematography in this show is always fantastic. I so love good. what they do, the way that they weave all of it together in the scenery. But I'm, yeah, I'm interested in seeing where this goes. I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. Which is a good thing. That's exactly what we want from a show. We want, we don't want the show to be predictable. We don't, most shows, we don't want to be predictable. We want, we want to be surprised. We want to, so yeah, I, I'm. I'm totally entranced by, by the, like you said, the cinematography. The only, uh, the only other note that I have that we haven't already talked about was you've already talked about the, the I talked about the cinematography, the cinemat <laughs> the cinematography and uh, that of, of the, the fireworks going off, but that scene, the special effects that they did when that harpoon hit the back of that train was so good to me. It just seemed brilliant. You know, and it, see the the flames, and we're de the, the the action of we're going to derail was just was just amazing to me. It added a lot of tension. When I saw that harpoon, it took me straight back to Game of Thrones and the giant um, arrows that came across to kill the dragons, like mm -hmm. the wooden pieces. Like if oh, yeah. And I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell, was that, was, was it Ben that fired? Not Ben. Was it Javi that fired the harpoon or was it the, the guy that was there? I, I couldn't tell because Wilford kind of grabs Javi's shoulders and is like, good job or something like that. And maybe just keeping the train going while the harpoon shot or something was what he was. I think, I'm not sure. About. See, some, I don't know the answer to that question. May have to rewatch the interview. Might have to rewatch re it again. I feel like mm -hmm. so much is happening now. It's going to take three or four watches to get every single thing that happens. I may have to rewatch it next week before the next one. I know. <laughs> I might. Oh, it's hard. It's hard. This is a, a complicated show sometimes. And you can miss things so quickly. If we miss something, guys... Be sure to send us in, send us a note and let us know what we missed because we want you to be part of this conversation with us. Please, please, absolutely. Um, so, any other notes for you? Well, let me see. The one thing that I do have is actually a quote, so I think I can do it in the quote section. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and start. I've only got a few quotes, so we'll see if we uh, if we duplicated each other or not. But we'll just go one by one. You can start. Well, um, when uh, Audrey finds out that she's been 
relegated to third class and banned from the night trade, which is her baby. She is told by Sykes that she picked the wrong side. And then Audrey says, has there ever been a right side on this goddamn train? And she's right, because it seems like there's always two people fighting for something. Whether it's Taylor's fighting over food or something going on in first class, there's always someone fighting over something. And you're always having to pick a side. I almost had that one, but I didn't. So mm -hmm. uh, one of the ones I've got is uh, one from Pike that I just absolutely loved. And I didn't get the whole quote, but it's the, I got the beginning of it. And when he's threatening Wiggins and he says, there's something you should know about Taylor's. We have long memories and we win wars. Yes, I had that on my list as well. In fact, all of my quotes we have already done. Okay. Which was Josie tending to Wilfred's injuries. I am the train. Uh, we talked about Asha's quote about doing things for children and regretting it. And Audrey and Till's conversation about singing covers. And that's, yeah, that's really all that I had. Uh, the only other two I had were real quick. And that's uh, when Till is talking to Miss Audrey and she says, you'll know it's him when his head is on a pike. Yes. And then the other one that, that I, I absolutely loved both times when I heard it because I'm retired military was when Leighton finds Ruth and he says, I never would have found you. You're in civvies. I thought that was <laughs> great. That's, that's what we always used to say. You're in civvies. Get your civvies on. Well, so. <laughs> They've come a long way since the beginning of this show, since we yes, started watching yeah. it way back in season one, when I thought Ruth would never be open to anything like a revolt or being part of any sort of war and yeah, now never she's would have thought. yeah she's an incredible leader like she really is she probably rightfully should be leading snowpiercer because i think she has the good she out of everyone on snowpiercer has the good of the train in her heart and so i think maybe she should be the one that's leading yeah and she's the one who said i know everyone on this train Mm -hmm. when, when they were wanting to do the census. So uh, we did get one piece of feedback and I think it's, I think it's a great lead in to talk about the, the preview for next week. Uh, okay. Do you want to read that from Christy? Absolutely. So Christy says, wow, what a fantastic action packed episode. Loved it and watched it twice already. So looking forward to next week. Anybody see the previews to next week? Yes. yes. <laughs> I can't help myself. I just can't help myself when it comes to the previews. So what do you want to talk about first, briefly talk about with the preview? Well, you want to talk about the last image of the preview or? Oh, I think we need to save that for last. Okay. Okay. I think that we can talk about the fact that in the preview, Pike is talking to Ruth and saying, basically, you know, you should be leading this train, which I, I kind of agree, just because, I, like I said, the, the most important factor to me is Ruth is so focused on the what's good for the train. That is why I think that she should be in charge. And it, it looks like from the preview, we're going to get either though they're going to encounter those first class cars that got separated in uh, season two was it yeah, season two um, or maybe those, I, I, I can't imagine it'd be just the four cars that Leighton and then lost. So it's gotta be the, the ones that had all the first, a bunch of first class passengers on it. So I, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how many deaths we might, or if they get a death toll or how they're going to move those cars out of the way, if they need to move them out of the way. Uh, yeah. If, I'm if not gonna, sure. So it's, it's, but that final image, and it's alluded to in the synopsis that I read for it, is I think we're going to get either a vision or something from Melanie next week. Well, either way, and, it's a gift. Yeah. Because Jennifer Connolly, yeah, I've missed having her on this show because she just brought this maturity and calmness to the role of Melanie, always keeping everything under control. Like Ruth, I think she did have the train 
you know, the best, she wanted what was best for the train, although she was disconnected from the plight of the people on it more than Ruth was. So I, absolutely. I don't know because in the preview, Melanie is saying, tell him. Yeah. And she's saying, and she's in a suit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, Again, I'm, oh, I wish we could have it right now. <laughs> I know. It's not one of those things, Steve. We can't just snap our fingers. We have to be patient. And I don't have a lot of patience. Anyone who knows me knows I have no patience whatsoever. None. But I am, I am hoping uh, we either get confirmation of her alive, dead, or it's just a vision. Those are basically <laughs> Yeah, Those I are mean, three choices. We don't really know. And there's a lot, I mean, that needs to happen or we need to see over the next few episodes because now that everyone's back together and they're getting reintroduced, there's going to be that aftermath of the last six months and what it's done to the people on Snowpiercer because there it's been hard having Wilford the, ter- the Terrible you know, Wilford the Terrible in charge. Yeah. And what are we going to get back to? So. Yeah. And then there's New Eden and that whole trip. Like, I feel like there's, there's a lot. We have a lot, a lot to look forward to and a lot of questions to be answered. Yeah. I loved, I loved that when, what was it? Was it Ruth? Ruth was the one who said, that getting to New Eden is getting to the Horn of Africa is going to be tough because there was the, the train, the tracks are bad. And the, so I'm assuming it must be an area that they avoided as I loved. That was another thing. I think I, I started to talk about it earlier uh, this evening. I loved all the track switching that we got to see and how they yeah. do that and how that, how that occurs and realizing just how many tracks there are over the entire world. Yeah. That, that they were that he really had to have some good engineers or he himself whoever it was that planned out those tracks because they knew they were going to be on that train for possibly i mean the Ever. rest of existence i don't yeah well and yeah. Th- they also talked about the tracks were very rough and there had been a war there when the climate first failed so it's going to be a dangerous area we don't know how bad it's going to be but i've looked at some of the things we've been through with this train so far and i'm just like how much worse can it really be they've had all of these things to deal with and i'm just yeah leighton says it what he says the train's being held together by you know duct tape and bailing wire yeah we've got to get off this train and it's it's one of those things that yeah they've only been on it for eight years i can't imagine what the next 70 would have what it was I like know like 70 so well and they don't have Melanie taking care of it and she knew how to take care of it perfectly everyone else it's really they're just making it work they're doing what they have to do to keep it running it's just it's not they're not as well trained yeah I think that's a good way of looking at it if you think about it because we talked about Ruth being being a leader and caring not about the train, Ruth cared about the passengers, mm-hmm. and Melanie cared about the train. So they had a great balance there of making sure things kept going. And it and it was it was you're right. It was Melanie's lack of empathy toward the plight of the Tailies that caused the revolt to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, and and Ruth not maybe not knowing as much about the train. It's not concerning about the train, the engineering of the train. Right. So, yeah, so there are two halves to a whole, but we really don't have the other half. What we have are Alex, Javi, and Ben that are going to have to add together to become Melanie to be able to manage the things that happen. I mean, and remember, we have no breachmen. They're all gone. Breachman, we yeah, so we don't have the people that knew how to repair things. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's getting it's getting it's getting tough. Yeah. I mean the world is an ever changing 
entity on Snowpiercer and being able to take care of it and ensure its long-term potential to run is going to be a big problem. It's a question mark at this point. They've been able to do some great things, but not enough. I mean, in the long run, Melanie kept that train going smoothly for, you know, the first seven years. Now we're going to be faced with the unknown. Very, very good. Wonderful discussion. Um, have no other feedback. I didn't see anywhere else, so we'll we'll move on. I have to talk about something and you may not have watched it, but I binged through the new Amazon prime show Reacher over the last couple of days. I got snowed in and, and spent some of that time watching Reacher with uh, Alan. I think his name is Richardson as the guy who played uh, Reacher in this, in this TV show. And it was really, really good. And I want to recommend Michael Rosenbaum's podcast inside of you. Cause he interviewed Alan Richmond this week, Richson this week. And it's, queued up in my podcast player uh, to hear, because I want to hear what this guy has <laughs> to say. But Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum, if you know who Michael Rosenbaum is, he was on Smallville and uh, a few other shows. He played Lex Luthor on the TV show Smallville. I know you've been super busy. I have. I am burning the candle at both ends. i am not been listening to any podcasts really outside of my regular podcast circle. So... Okay, so the podcast that I'm going to share is one called Let's Get Down to Business. It's actually a figure skating podcast, as Steve just suggested. It's a couple of cousins, and one of them, Jocelyn, is a friend of a friend. I actually have met her at a competition. And yeah, they break down competitions. They have lots of opinions. It's a lot of fun to listen to them. So yeah, it's called Lots. Very cool get down to business. All right. You are listening to us on your podcast player of choice. If it's able to give us, if you are able to give us a review, we would love a five-star review on that podcast player of choice. We will read it out here if we get contacted with it and uh, just love to hear from our listeners on any of those platforms. You can check out our website at panels to pixels podcast.com. We are on Facebook, facebook.com slash panels to pixels. We are on Twitter at Panels to Pixels, and that's Panels and Pixels spelled out with the number two in the middle. We have an email address, which is panels to pixels one at gmail.com. Panels to pixels one, that's the TO spelled out right there in the middle with the number one at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube if you search Panels to Pixels podcast, and please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our feed. We are on Instagram at Panels to Pixels Podcast, all spelled out with letters at Panels to Pixels Podcast on Instagram. And you should check out all the other podcasts on the Next Level Online Podcast Network. We highly recommend them. Wilhelm, The Melting Pat, Podcast Zero, and so much more. Go to nextlevelradioonline.com and check all of them out there. Next week, we will continue on with the Force Up. Fourth episode of Snowpiercer, which is entitled Bound by One Track. Woohoo! One track. One train. Are we going to have another train? No. I think what that means is the fact that they're all back together now and there's going to be some debris in the way that they're going to have to deal with. Well, Daphne, what have you got coming up on Run for Your Lives? Well, last week we had a little break, um, vacation and just being super busy. We did not have an episode in the can for that week. So we decided to take the week off this week. We are coming back with an episode on a 2019 movie called Little Monsters. And I it's, did watch it. It's quite a little movie. It's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, we have a lot to say about it. So I'm Good. looking forward to getting that one out at the end of the week. I look forward to hearing it. I did send in a live Steve for it. So we'll see. I that, saw that. I can't that wait went. to listen to it. I never listen until Peck and I can listen together. I, 
I think I stayed coherent on this one. Maybe. I don't know. I guess we'll uh, see. <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> and as for me, you'll hear me right here on Panels to Pixels. Laura and I will be covering the next episode of The Witcher. Uh, this this Friday, so you can send us your feedback for that. I'm going to try to get out posts. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do like what Strange Indeed does with the Netflix shows, where I'm going to have a feedback on a feedback post in fa on Facebook for each episode that's coming up. That way, they're just out there, and if you want to put the feedback in there, we'll read them at the time that we cover that episode. If you've already watched the entire series, that sounds great. With that, we have come to the end. Daphne, I appreciate you. And thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Steve. It's been a lot of fun so far. I can't wait to see where that lovely Snowpiercer train is going to take us next. Absolutely. So this was Panels to Pixels, and we will see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night. Good night.